Hello everyone, thank you so much for coming back for another study and we've got a great one for you today. We're going to talk about the prophecy and the importance, what it means to the church that the kingdom of Israel, the nation of Israel split into two kingdoms, the north and the south, Israel and Judah. But before I get into that and establishing that prophecy and reading the prophecies to you and going over just a few of the events to show you what it means to the church, I want to talk to you about why this channel keeps talking about the two raptures, the two groups, and the third snatching, which isn't really a rapture because those who are snatched remain in their mortal bodies. But the reason why we keep teaching on this and showing from so many different directions how we know that the bride and the church are two different groups, but the bride is tucked in the church right now, and she's going to be removed from the church very soon. And the reason why we keep talking about this is because, I'm going to share just seven reasons. I mean, there's many more reasons, but one, we want you to be equipped to teach others Bible prophecy and have correct interpretations because as you've noticed there's a lot of confusion out there in our churches and on the internet and so we want to make sure you're equipped with the truth and how to find the truth and how to double check the truth because God in his word has provided us with ways to double check our prophetic interpretations. He knew there would be all this confusion, but those who take the time, and it does take time, you know, I'm, I can't hide that from you, it takes time, but you've got to check the interpretations. Okay, another thing that these types of studies do is it wakes up sleepy Christians who have had their ears tickled. Yes, I have been able to wake up so many people by just showing them how there are two groups. There is the bride and there is the church and the bride goes up pre-trib and the church goes up mid-trib. And it's some people don't wanna hear it uh, because it means, oh, they've got some responsibility. They might have to study the word. Uh, they might have to do some self-reflection and maybe some repentance, which is often the case. Uh, so it does. It, does we have proven it it wakes up sleepy Christians another thing is it enables you to be a peacemaker when the subject of the rapture does come up in conversations whether it's in church or family gatherings or social get-togethers you get to say regardless if you're pre-trib mid-trib or post-trib you're all a little bit right and you're all a little bit wrong or we're all a little bit right we're all a little bit wrong but let me share what i've learned so it gives you that opportunity to be a peacemaker well by studying that there are there is the bride the church and the remnant you understand more of what Jesus was saying and doing because he came to fulfill the law and the prophets. So a lot of the things he was doing and saying, he was referring to and speaking to and giving more information about the church, the bride, the church, and the remnant. So it, when you reread the Bible, you understand more of Jesus and what he was doing and communicating. All right, another thing that this, this helps you do by um, having these studies is you'll know when a prophecy teacher or one of the watchmen, are when they're teaching on a particular sign, you will know if they're talking about a sign that has to do with the bride, the church, or the remnant, because most of what they've been talking about these signs have to do with the church, not the pre trib rapture of the bride. Many times they're talking about a sign that's coming, and but it's really, that's a sign for the remnant, and it's actually going, to, the sign is going to be more uh, in their face, so to speak. Well, you'll discover the glorified ministry of the bride, once she's in her fancy body, and then the church, once they are raptured and in their fancy body. Because it causes one to ask, well, why, is, why does the bride go up first at pre-trib? Why does the church go up mid-trib? Why is there a remnant left behind? What's their role in all of this? So 
it helps you study through the scripture because the answers are there. Our glorified ministry is in the scriptures. So if you don't know to be looking, you're not going to catch it. All right. And another and the final one I'll share is you gain more wisdom and understanding about Bible prophecy, which is how the bride makes herself ready. Because those who are not studying Bible prophecy, they think that, oh, bride goes up pre-trib and it includes the whole church, everybody who said the prayer, you're all going. Anybody who calls himself a Christian, they're going up in the rapture and they're going to get married and go on a seven-year honeymoon with Jesus Christ while all hell is breaking loose on earth. And so they're not making themselves ready for their ministry in their raptured body. So since they are not ready, I don't know how it's going to turn out from them, but there's still time for every person in the body of Christ to be making themselves ready. Okay, so now I want to get into what our subject is going to be about, and that is how the nation of Israel, the household of God, was split into two groups, the north and the south. And it says in Romans 15, 4, for whatever was written in earlier times was written for our instruction, so that through perseverance and the encouragement of the scriptures, we might have hope. All right, so we look at the written prophecies that had to do with Israel, and we look at the events and the people and the places, and we've been, you know, finding out the, what the name of the place means, and we look for the types and shadows. That's what we do to understand Bible prophecy. 1 Corinthians 10, 11 says, Now these things happened to them as an example, and they were written for our instruction, upon whom the ends of the ages have come. So this is why we want to pay attention to the Old Covenant, the Old Testament. We want to pay attention to Israel's history before the they went into Egypt their slavery when they came out of Egypt that struggle in the wilderness and then that testing that went on to see who would enter into the promised land all of that is written for our instructions that we will learn because God is trying to get you into the kingdom of God he's trying to get you into that pre-trib rapture of the bride he's not trying to keep you out he's made the offer available to every person in the body of Christ every person has the opportunity to be the bride and go up pre-trib and have an amazing ministry okay so now just like the northern kingdom of Israel was taken from the land first, going up to Assyria, so too will the bride be taken from the land first, going up north to heaven at pre-trib. Later, the southern kingdom, Judah, was also taken off their land. They were taken up to, at that time it was then, Babylon up north. And they joined the rest of their kingdom up there in Babylon. Well, so too, the church will be taken later, removed from the land. And they will be raptured up north. And that's where they will rejoin the household of God, the kingdom of God, the bride, which will be in heaven. Okay, so, it, and we're going to learn here that it was God who divided Israel because of all the idolatry that Solomon was partaking in, funny thing, over brides. Mm -hmm. He was taking on too many wives. They caused him to fall into idolatry because all of these wives of his, think of them, each one is an idol. And think of also, the church has been coming into covenants with the world, and it's so subtle. We have to watch ourselves to make sure that we're keeping things in perspective, and we're keeping the main person the main person, and that is Jesus Christ. We want to make sure we're taking that time in the Word, prayerfully studying the Word. You know, there's reading the Word just to get the Word in you and see how things happen in a chronological order. Many people are studying the chronological logical order of the um, 
ministry of Christ or the Old Testament, and that's a great thing to do. Um, but there's also times that you want to really dig in and study and follow those uh, rabbit trails that the Holy Spirit takes you on to get your questions answered. So it was God who divided the nation of Israel into two kingdoms, the north and the south, because had he not done that, idolatry was so prolific, the whole nation would have been lost. They all would have succumbed to idol worship. So too, the rapture is going to come at just the right time, and the bride is going to be removed as kind of a wake-up call, because that's what it did for the northern kingdom. When they saw things shaken up and threats from the Assyrians, well, that really woke a lot of them up. Some went down south, relocated to Judah. Uh, some actually left the, whole, the area altogether. Some went into Africa, some into Asia. So <clears throat> God is going to remove the bride at just the right time because if the church remains on its trajectory and involved in all these different movements, and which brings confusion into the whole church. When you think about how many movements there are, I mean, there might be 10 tribes in the church. Uh, when you think about the Hebrew roots movement, the apostolic reformation, the social justice movement, the new age movement, uh, we can go on and on and on because new tribes keep seeming to join the church and uh, polluting our true worship. So, you know, as I mentioned, it was the northern kingdom that went up first. The ten tribes, they were more idolatrous, so they were removed from the land first. And then later it was Judah, the southern kingdom. Uh, then they too succumbed to idolatry, and they were removed from the land. Well. What's going to happen here in the end times here is that is reversed. It's going to be the southern kingdom. Judah is going to be removed first, representing the bride. And then the church will go up later at mid-trib. So Matthew 20, 16, Jesus addresses this. Matthew 20, 16, New American Standard. He says, so the last shall be first and the first shall be last. Well, we're going to notice, if you study that out on your own, that what does Jesus begin to talk about immediately after making that statement? Because it gives a clue about what he's referring to. Well, I'll tell you, right after he said that statement, he began giving prophecies about his death and resurrection. So he's giving, we're getting a time frame here. Uh, he also then, right immediately after that, is when the mother of James and John came to him seeking good positioning for her sons in the kingdom of God, the left side and the right side of the throne of Jesus. So Jesus is addressing this. He goes on to say, down in verse 27, Matthew 20, verse 27, whoever wishes to be first among you shall be your slave. So now he's addressing this again. Just as the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve. And you know, this is the purpose, one of the purposes for the bride going up first at pre-trib is because she's going to be serving the left behind church, the left behind brethren, she loves them. We love the church. Indeed, sometimes we get a little bit impatient with those who, it, it, they make unstudied opinions about the scriptures. Uh, yeah, that can be kind of frustrating, but you know, we have patience with them because once we are in our fancy body and we are the true rider on the white horse, indeed, there's going to be the counterfeit, the man of peace that will come riding in and making peace. So, the bride is already, we're studying the Bible in a way that we can accurately teach the left behind church because that's one of the reasons why they're left behind. They don't know the word. They're drinking in all these other theories that were involved in all these other movements, these other tribes that are in the church. And 
there is just so much teaching that we need to sift through. And so the bride is sifting through that. Just like we had to sift through all the different religions to find the true religion and Jesus Christ as the true God, God Almighty. Well, we're sifting through all the prophecies. We're sifting through all the movements in the church. And we want to be accurate. And we're doing this. We take the time and we study. We prayerfully study so that we can better serve the left behind church because they're going to need us then. Okay, well then, after the church is safely up in heaven at the mid-trib rapture in their fancy bodies, well, they'll be serving the left-behind remnant. Because just like after Israel and Judah were removed from their land and went up north, a remnant was left behind. And they suffered terribly. They didn't have many resources. Okay, so that's the group, that remnant, after the church is raptured mid-trib, it's that remnant that's really going to suffer incredible hardship. And that's the time of Jacob's trouble. And that's also called the Great Tribulation. The entire seven years is not called the time of Jacob's trouble. In fact, Jacob is actually building the beast system that first half. And they're not in trouble. No, they're, they're actually creating some of the trouble. But it's when the Antichrist, that the red dragon turns on them. And that's when they recognize, oh my gosh, we picked the wrong rulers to rule over us. That's why the second half is called the time of Jacob's trouble. And since the once the red dragon is thrown down to earth in Revelation chapter 12, he's called the great dragon, and that starts the great tribulation. <clears throat> okay, so what is interesting is when King David ruled over his nation. Israel was one nation. It was shortly after the son of David died that the kingdom of Israel was divided. Now, it was prophesied that that would happen. We can read the prophecies in the Old Covenant, and we know that prophecies are cyclical. So we can read of those prophecies in 1 Kings chapter 11. It was the prophet Ahia that gave a detailed prophecy and he is the one who told Solomon, your kingdom's going to be divided. You're going to lose your kingdom. And then it was Ahia that told Jeroboam that he was going to get the ten kingdoms. And then that prophecy was repeated in the same chapter. It's given three times. And even that is prophetic. Okay, so here's what the Lord said to Solomon in 1 Kings 11.11, 11, and it goes through verse 13. The Lord said to Solomon, Because you have done this, and you have not kept my covenant and my statutes, which I have commanded you, I will surely tear the kingdom from you and will give it to your servant. Nevertheless, I will not do it in your days for the sake of your father David, but I will tear it out of the hand of your son. However, I will not tear away all the kingdom, but I will give one tribe to your son, and that was Rehoboam, for the sake of my servant David and for the sake of Jerusalem, which I have chosen. Well, then the prophecy was repeated a second time. 1 Kings chapter 11, verse 29 through 32. It came about at that time when Jeroboam went out of Jerusalem that the prophet Ahia, the Shiloh knight, found him on the road. Now Ahia had clothed himself with a new cloak and both of them were alone in the field. That should trigger some thoughts to other passages in the Old Testament. Verse 30, Then Ahia took hold of the new cloak which was on him and tore it into twelve pieces. He said to Jeroboam, Take for yourself ten pieces. For thus says the Lord, the God of Israel, Behold, I will tear the kingdom out of the hand of Solomon and give you ten tribes. But he will have one tribe for the sake of my servant David and for the sake of Jerusalem, the city which I have chosen from all the tribes of Israel. Okay, then it's repeated a third time in that chapter. Verses 35 through 37. But I will take the kingdom from the, his son's hand and give it to you, even ten tribes. But to his son I will give one tribe. 
that my servant David may have a lamp always before me in Jerusalem, the city where I have chosen for myself to put my name. I will take you, and you shall reign over whatever you desire, and you shall be king over Israel. Okay, now what I want you to notice, and maybe some of you have already, Ahia, the prophet, from Shiloh, had a new garment on. He takes it off, he rips it into 12 pieces. He says to Jeroboam, take 10 pieces, because each one represents a tribe. Take one for yourself. Take the 10 tribes for yourself. Okay, so Jeroboam has his 10 pieces of Ahia's garment. So that means Ahia now has two pieces. Now he says, Ahia says, I have one piece one tribe I'm going to give to Solomon's son, Rehoboam. Okay, who gets that twelfth piece? Not Rehoboam, not Jeroboam. Who gets that? Ahia, the prophet. It's his garment. There's twelve tribes. Look at what God was communicating. The prophet, Ahia, gets that tribe. What does that tribe represent? The prophets! Because in the bride community, there are many of us who are prophetic. We're studying the prophecies. We are, um, you know, it takes time. We're praying over the prophecies. We're trying to figure out how do they all fall in place? Because the first thing to do before all these people start picking dates is you have to first find out how the prophecies line up, who they're delivered to, who they are symbolize, and then you can start working on if you are inclined to a rapture date. Okay, so now we're going to look at what does the name Ahia mean? Well, it comes from two Hebrew words. H251 and H3050. It means worshiper of Yah. It means brother that is worshiper of Yah, to be specific. Ahi is brother. Yah is the Almighty God. Ahi also means H251, brother or resemblance, another, kindred, like, other brother. So, what is this telling you about Ahia? What does Shiloh mean? Well, wow, that's really interesting. Uh, Shiloh comes from two Hebrew words, H7951, and I didn't put the other one. Sorry. So it means tranquil, tranquil. It's an epithet of the Messiah. It means to be secure or successful, be happy, prosper, be in safety. And so it is in, when I'm in the word, when I'm in the stronghold, that's where my safety is. That's where my tranquility is, my peacefulness and my prosperity. That's where we are to find it. We can go back out in the world and things are crazy around us, but Shiloh is our peaceful place. And knowing that it's an epithet of the Messiah, a name for the Messiah, that adds extra weight, doesn't it? Okay, so now since Ahia let me see how much time do I have. Oh, you know what? I think I'm going to I'm gonna close this down now. All right. Thank you so much for watching. I hope this was intriguing. And I hope it's in, uh, you know, helps you know why we want to keep studying Bible prophecy and looking at the prophetic layer of the entire Bible and the benefits that you reap from that, those seven benefits that I mentioned at the beginning of the video. So I'll talk to you later. Bye. Mm -hmm.